Here's some quick context for this video before we begin properly. A few months ago, the gaming community was blessed with the silver release of Project Sonic 06, or PO6 for short, a ground-up remake of Sonic 2006 and Xbox 360, a game that didn't turn out so well, being considered one of gaming's worst outings. One man decided to remake the game from scratch and see its potential through, and that was Project 06. It's not quite finished yet, but I decided to review it a few months ago because with the silver release we had access to the three major campaigns the original game had, and I thought that was enough to do a video on. PO6 has been one of my favorite games of all time. Honestly, from the moment we had the Sonic release in 2020, but that really got cemented when the Shadow release came out in 2021. But the reason this video exists is because of the fact that one thing I frequently hear from people who were not interested in trying PO6 was that, underneath all the technical problems of Sonic 06, the game had too much automation or some other issue that prevented them from enjoying the new, fan-made version of it. But that example specifically got me thinking about automation in Sonic as a concept, and I felt like this was worth discussing, as automation is one of those things in online Sonic discourse that people really are heated about, so I decided to dedicate an entire video to my thoughts on the subject. But before I even think about it, we need to talk about the sponsor of today's video, because... This video was brought to you by Nixie. The makers of some really high-quality third-party game controllers. I'm sure you've had one of those moments. You know, the ones, where you're playing some kind of a retro game on a modern console. Back in the day, controllers used to vary in design by console before the more standard design we know today was settled in. So when you're playing something like, say, Super Mario Sunshine on the Nintendo Switch, you might find that the Switch Pro Controller or the Joy-Cons aren't quite replicating that GameCube feel. Nixie's latest line of controllers revives the GameCube controller for the Switch, but it's not a copy of the original. It actually features improvements over the original design, like a properly sized D-pad and second stick alongside having four shoulder buttons, so it provides that retro feel while also being perfectly compatible as a modern controller. You can even take the sides of the controller off and use it in place of the Joy-Cons in portable mode if you want that retro feel on the go. But it doesn't stop there, because they don't just do Switch controllers, they have controllers for the Steam Deck and for PC. It's a whole catalog you should definitely check out because I know how interested you are. So head on over to the link in the description and or the pinned comment and have a grand old time. Thanks again to Nixie for sponsoring this video. And with that said, we may now return to the regularly scheduled program. All right, let's begin with one simple question. What do people mean by automation in Sonic? The simple answer is that they're referring to the parts of Sonic games where the game takes control away from the player and allows them to watch the game play itself for a few seconds. Games achieve this via dash pads that propel you forward automatically, and they can mean it by talking about prolonged sequences with springs bouncing you from wall to wall, or with extended grind rail sequences that don't require much interactivity from the player. Some people use this term when talking about entire styles of gameplay, like the storybook Sonic games or the boosting gameplay. So the natural question to follow up with that is, what's the issue? Well, it all comes from a mindset within the Sonic community that the appeal of Sonic was strictly about using Sonic speed, which you learn to control through skill and practice to get through stages quicker than you could before expertly. As a result, the issue people have with segments in the 3D games that merely show you Sonic moving at incredible speed or dodging some kind of obstacle is cheapening that appeal and creating that sense of speed through inauthentic means making gameplay that is simple and inferior to what was done in the original games. In a vacuum, I don't think this is problematic thinking. However, I think this is often treated as a zero-sum game where the existence of automation in and of itself means a stage is getting points off regardless of execution of the surrounding game mechanics. I think this subject desperately needs more nuance, and I wanted to bring my thoughts to the table on the subject of automation in Sonic. Starting with the simple fact that automation has always existed in this series, and that's no joke. In the first couple of games, Sonic 1, Sonic 2, and Sonic CD, there weren't a lot of moments where the game took control away from the players in order to show them things happen, but the times that they did were very important. In the very first Sonic level, Green Hill Zone Act 1, the stage ends with Sonic going through a tube that automatically gives him enough speed upon exit to launch you into the air to grab these rings right before the stage ends. What made this part so iconic was that it was a signature moment to show the audience what kind of speed Sonic was capable of moving at. Then, the opening stage of Sonic CD, Palm Tree Panic, includes these ramps that Sonic would travel up and go flying from, which was also meant to wow players at the time and serve much of the same purpose as the Green Hill Tube. CD also has other moments of automation, like the tubes you travel through in Stardust Speedway or Collision Chaos, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. It's Sonic 2 that first featured automation in Sonic as it's typically defined today. Chemical Plant, perhaps Sonic 2's most iconic stage, is one that is loaded with these dash pads that propel Sonic at top speed. 
In terms of technology, it was another demonstration of what Sonic was capable of in the sequel since the speed cap that Sonic had in the first game was removed, and you could just outrun the screen in Sonic 2. These are the moments the game was sold on because it made Sonic look the coolest compared to other games. And that's how you get to Sonic 3 and Knuckles. This is one of the most beloved 2D platformers from the early 90s and is pretty commonly placed at the top of many people's favorite Sonic game lists. But then when you play it, this game has more automation than any 2D Sonic game ever before. Angel Island Zone Act 2 ends with a part where you have to do absolutely nothing besides holding forward while a ship passes over your head and drops bombs. But like I said, you don't have to do anything besides hold forward to get through this. Hydro City Zone has numerous moments where the player gets funneled through these tubes at full speed, making it easy to go fast and fly off an incline when you regain control. Carnival Night has automated sequences, Ice Cap Zone Act 1 famously opens with Sonic on a snowboard that completely plays itself for several seconds. Sky Sanctuary bounces players from area to area with springs and has its most iconic moment play out in a cutscene. And then, the Death Egg Zone forces you through these teleportation tubes that take control away from you for several seconds. So what exactly is it I'm trying to say? Well, these are fully automated bits in Sonic 3K, and they're set pieces, defining moments to make the level stick out in your head, in addition to the regular gameplay you came for. Set pieces are allowed to be in Sonic games. This has been a defining element of the franchise's DNA since day one. It's not a unique invention of the 3D series. Sonic Adventure 1 follows in the footsteps of Sonic 3K by giving levels defining moments that would stick out in your mind after the first playthrough, such as getting chased by an orca on the docks of Emerald Coast or running down the side of a building in Speed Highway. These are some of the easiest moments in the game because it doesn't require much besides holding forward. And yet, these are some of the most iconic moments in the history of Sonic because it was pretty cool to see the first time and that sticks with people. This is the approach I'd say Sonic Adventure 2 and Sonic Heroes also followed in their speed-oriented stages. Adventure 2 set pieces usually required more effort than the previous game, like how you can do tricks off of ramps in the city escape chase scene that takes practice to get right, or how you have to maneuver the board at the end of Metal Harbor to get all the rings and life boxes. But it still is a game that has a separation between parts where you have to play the game and parts where you're meant to enjoy the spectacle of moving really fast. And like I said, I feel Sonic Heroes follows the same mindset, albeit in a jankier game where there are things more prone to going wrong and getting the player killed in spectacular fashion. I think the issue many take with the 3D series is merely that the influence of spectacle over substance became more skewed towards spectacle as time went on. After all, Sonic Adventure 2 has more linear level design than Sonic Adventure 1, since Adventure 2 stages were solely focused on the speed element, since they were designed for Sonic alone, unlike Adventure 1, which had to make room for multiple characters in one stage. The ultimate example of spectacle taking over the franchise franchise is how we got entire Sonic games built around it. The storybook games in the Wii forced Sonic along a straight line with no deviation. The first of these, Secret Rings, only required the player to move Sonic out of the way of obstacles as he ran forward without any input from players. In theory, it makes every stage one prolonged set piece. However, the game fought against itself a little too much with its early Wii Remote controls not keeping up with the action adequately enough and its clunky upgrade mechanics too. The sequel, Black Knight, offered improvement in that you could control Sonic, but the point of every stage was still that you had to see Sonic go through obstacles at breakneck speed while you swung the sword whenever required. But those were just games capitalizing on the gimmicky nature of the Nintendo Wii, I hear you say. What actually showed Sonic's decline from skill-oriented play to games playing themselves was when Sonic Unleashed came out in 2008 and brought the boosting mechanic into 3D. Now Sonic stages were still pretty linear, and the goal was pressing one button to go at light speed, and you have to dodge obstacles at that incredible speed. This style of gameplay that kept getting used in Sonic games after this has been criticized for being, quote, boost to win, which means that it's a gameplay style designed around holding the boost button on a linear track. I think the boosting Sonic gameplay has inherent issues, but I don't believe this is one of them. First, because the boost games that are good, Sonic Unleashed, Sonic Colors, and Sonic Generations all take different approaches to it. Sonic Colors, for example, uses stretches of boosting gameplay as a reward for getting through slower paced 2D platforming segments. Sonic Generations tried to marry the reaction time based gameplay of Sonic Unleashed with the platforming approach of Sonic Colors, and I think it made for a really cohesive union where it felt like you were going really fast almost all the time but still had actual platforming going on in most of the stages. I think the inherent issue with boosting Sonic is that going so fast required the devs to come up with some kind of a way to compensate for that speed, since the speed stages have to be really massive and yet blown through really quickly. As a result, every one of these games compensates in different ways that I've gone into in previous videos, like how Unleashed spends 75% of the runtime in a completely different genre of game, Colors spends more time on platforming in 2D, and Generations also focuses on different gameplay for half of it as well. But to look at the boosting segments in isolation, the boost to win criticism is directed towards how there now is a go fast button, when the design of Sonic at the beginning was supposed to be around getting the players skilled enough to learn how to go fast. 
But with all those points established, I can finally go into what my point is here, which is the reason I think this discussion warrants nuance. To look at it in the way I just described leaves it as a spin dash momentum good, boosting bad mentality because the maximum speed is earned in one case and not in the other. But to look at it like that takes out all the context and treats it as a zero-sum game of less automation is automatically good. When the fact is, there are completely different approaches of designing a game that can require skill but in a different way. In a game like Sonic 1, or even Sonic Adventure 1, going at and maintaining top speed was the ultimate mark of good play, and was how you got the most satisfaction out of the game mechanics. But to frame Unleashed, for example, as a game that plays itself is incredibly reductive because yes, you get max speed by holding a button, but the challenge isn't getting top speed, it's being able to get through the levels at that speed while not taking damage. Sonic Unleashed is actually one of the harder Sonic games when you think about it because playing it at a high level involves going at the fastest speed the series has ever seen while needing to know the levels well enough to be able to take do or die shortcuts and slide under low ceilings and not take a hit to maintain all your rings for the sake of the score tally at the end. It's just a different approach to designing Sonic that I think still maintains some of the original appeal while also doing its own thing. As I said, automation and spectacle have always been in Sonic from the very beginning. I don't think the appeal of Sonic was that it was a momentum puzzle box. He went really fast and that was really cool. But then, am I saying that this is a case where it's always good and should not be criticized? No, I'm absolutely not saying that. I'm saying that the automation debate requires a look at what the game was trying to do and what it achieved in its final state. Because, of course, there are examples of automation gone wrong. Look no further than the original Sonic 06 on Xbox 360. I skipped over this one earlier because it's an easy game to look at for segments of prolonged automation. Dash pads take you through loops and springs bounce you from point to point with no interactivity for the player. But I don't think this is the largest issue. Like many things I point to when talking about 06, it's the fact that the game plays like trash. When you're not doing prolonged sequences of automation, the characters are stiff, slow, and sluggish. The combat is monotonous, the game is buggy and unpolished, leading to several frustrating moments. You get no satisfaction from playing the normal parts of the stages, so when you're forced into prolonged automated sequences that remind you this is supposed to be a Sonic game, it just makes you wish you were playing any other Sonic game because you could have fun going fast without all the automation. Another case where automation is completely out of control is Sonic Forces. This is a case where I often highlight how much the game plays itself. The opening of the stage, Luminous Forest, sees the player hold the boost button for 17 uninterrupted seconds while absolutely nothing is happening. Arsenal Pyramid, Lost Valley, Sunset Heights, you name it, and this game just has the player holding forward and boosting. This is where the aforementioned nuance gets brought into the conversation. In something like Unleashed or Generations, you got to go this fast in levels that made you play them. Forces is not one of those games as there's almost no challenge to speak of and the levels are all about 90 seconds long. It sucks, needless to say. I can't really talk about anything besides the automation and forces because what else is there? Nothing. The levels are too short and too linear to offer much to enjoy. It's an empty game and a case of what can go wrong when you design a Sonic game around spectacle and nothing else. And that's how I'm brought back to the note the video opened with. The thing that prompted this whole discussion in the first place. The fan game Project Sonic 06. I'm not shy about saying this is my favorite Sonic game of all time and it's built off the back of Sonic 06 which is one of the worst. In using all the same levels as the original, P06 technically includes all the same automated sequences that the original 06 had. But I've always had this incredible disconnect with people who I see use the automation in 06 slash P06 as a reason to why the game fundamentally can't work when I've gotten so much enjoyment out of playing the game for literally hundreds of hours. I realized when hearing that argument that automation in Sonic was treated as the zero-sum game I said it was earlier because I, once again, felt like this divorced the automation from the surrounding context. Think back to like a minute ago when I was talking about the original Sonic 06. Springs and dash pads didn't kill that game. Atrocious gameplay did. In P06, every character is fixed and made super fun to play. I won't go through the effort of re-reviewing P06, you can just watch the video I already made, or look forward to the video I do on the next major update. But some examples include how the slow and awkward spin dash from the original 06 is now like how it was in the other games, giving you quick bursts of speed. Shadow actually has a spin dash now like he should. His combat is super fast and fun to play around with to rack up massive point bonuses. Silver was made a really quick and fun character with his various upgrades to turn him into the badass he was supposed to be. And the list goes on and on and on. Now, when you marathon the levels in PO6, I'm thinking about using the blue gem as Sonic to go super fast and bounce off enemies for a quick shortcut or getting enough of the maturity meter filled as silver to go into ESP overdrive mode and fly over platforming segments as the gauge has just enough energy to make some of the major skips, or how I plan on what enemies I'll kill as Shadow and in what order to keep his uninhibited mode going for as long as possible for fear of losing it and being open for damage. With all that said, does it really matter that big loops will have dash pads on them that will carry you forward for a few seconds? 
The surrounding gameplay is so involved and fun to do. Who cares about a couple parts where you see some fast spectacle? And even then, in PO6, it is simple to avoid most of the scripted sequences. Like the opening one in Flame Core, just jump around it. Or homing attack in the later parts of the rails in Shadow's Crisis City. Simple. With speedrunning tricks, you can get through quite a lot of these segments while maintaining control. Which I do, because I've now played the stages so many times that I get a lot of satisfaction from the major skips. But all these skips and upgrade advantages are things you have to work for in the game and practice with to get the most out of. It's pure gaming action, endlessly replayable for me. And that is the point that ties all of this together. It's about the context and content. In Sonic 3 and Knuckles, it doesn't mean anything to me that there are parts where the game plays itself, because Sonic 3K does plenty in regards to actually playing the game that you almost forget all that exists. Sonic 3K is a game of using speed and momentum to reach areas you wouldn't be able to if you didn't know what you were doing, and being able to do so requires a degree of skill with the game mechanics. This is how I feel about the classic Sonic games, and the good games using the adventure style, and the good games that use the boosting style. In games with mechanical depth, I don't mind a sequence where I just go through a quick set piece. In games where the gameplay sucks, or where no gameplay exists, segments of the game playing itself will become a much larger issue in addition to all the other ones. So, I hope that clears that up for the folks at home. Point being, PO6 sure is great, and if your computer can run it and you're a Sonic fan, I believe you need to play it because the fun you can have with the game with all the upgrades and while doing speedruns is near endless, if you ask me. But that's basically all the time we have for today. So in closing, I hope this discussion has been useful. If not, feel free to leave a lengthy angry comment, I'll definitely be sure not to read it. So until next time, I'll say what I always do. If you've gotten this far into the video, I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.